Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we will know what button to push next in the market with Tom Thornton, founder of Hedge Fund Telemetry, providing actionable research and specialized investment content from inside the hedge fund world with unique perspectives and insights like no other. So excited to speak with you today, Tom. So how are you doing? I'm doing just fine. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Truly honored to have you here today. So Hedge Fund Telemetry, I think the name is amazing. Um, I want you to tell us how you came up with that name. If you could tell us what it means to you. Okay, well, it's actually, um, it goes back a while um, and it sort of carries into some one of my passions, which is Formula One racing. I've been following Formula One racing for decades, and um, I was in the hedge fund world for a bunch of years. Um, I, actually, I still am, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I uh, I was the head trader of a five billion dollar hedge fund, and. I would be getting into my office at 5.30 every morning. And on the way into my office, I would uh, be taking phone calls from European derivatives traders from JP Morgan or Goldman or whoever I would be talking to and saying, okay, let me know what's going on, what's coming into the world right now that I'm walking into. And I would get so much data from different places, uh, from emails on research from different firms, uh, and what I would do is I would take all that data and condense it of what's important for our particular fund. Uh, we were a long short uh, equity hedge fund. Uh, we did have some macro overtones and I did the technical work for the firm. Uh, but basically I would take everything, combine it, and then push it out to the firm in a note each day and on Sundays uh, and talk about what is going to matter for our market or our our firm and our our positions and so it's a, it's very similar to what in formula one back in the late 80s and early 90s they started to all the teams started to put sensors on every single piece of the car and when the car would go around a lap and pass the pits the data would be transferred to the pits they would crunch the numbers and they would say uh Ayrton, you need to slow down your brake are too hot and uh, help him get the optimal setup for the car. And that was sort of how I look at things. So I get data from everywhere and I try to find the optimal setup uh, for a portfolio. And I think that's um, the whole part about hedge fund telemetry. And I, I, uh, I had the idea back in 2013, I was, uh, after my hedge fund closed, I was uh, running uh, the family office for the founder of the hedge fund. And I thought it would be sort of interesting to be able to put my data and my research out to the masses. And I, I didn't do it at first. And then I um, did a couple other things and uh, raising money for a Chinese private equity fund and Alibaba I raised money for before they went public, which was pretty fun. Uh, but one of my trader friends that I worked with, he's like, you know, you put this work out and I still put work out um, the same data, not as much as I do now, but he's like, you should put it out there and really pursue this. So I, in 2017, and I will be honest, it was at a very low point in my life. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, the hedge fund world had changed and I wasn't planning on starting another hedge fund. Um, I had, first of all, I don't have the capital to do that. It takes a ton. I don't have the uh, bandwidth uh, personally um, to go through that whole process again. I've been in two startup hedge funds uh, in my life, and that's about enough. But I put it out there on Twitter, and I said, if anybody wants my note, please DM me and let's go. And I had, I think, like 2,000 followers, and I had 500 people that day send me a DM, and I found this internet guy, and I'm like, oh my God, we got a, we got a problem here. We got to get all these e emails in. So I started putting out my stuff, and I really was fortunate. I, I was connected with uh, the, the principles of Real 
television, uh, Raul Paul and Grant Williams uh, were friends, old friends, and they put me on in front of the camera. I was awful. I'm, I'm still awful in front oh, of the stop. camera. You're great. I admit it. It's like marbles in my mouth. I mean, blah, 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 blah. But um, it just took off. And now I have a really nice business. Uh, put out a lot of research. Uh, I work six days a week. And I just find the business addictive. And um, I can't stop. I just, I don't know. I That's, that's generally how hedge fund telemetry started and where we are right now. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Your passion is so evident. And I mean, obviously you're in high demand. Everyone wants to read your beautiful notes that you write, I believe three times a day now. Is that correct? Right. It's, um, that's another thing. I, 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 I like to put out my research during the day because I think it's timely and there's a lot of newsletters and and research from the sell side that will put out their stuff and they wrote it the next the day before and by the time you get it it's almost stale and so I want to be able to talk about tomorrow I'm, I've got a note coming out before the CPI and I have one coming out right after the CPI so I want people to understand exactly how I'm thinking at all times and I put trade ideas on the on my notes uh, all three of them uh, throughout the day, if I have the ideas. And uh, I just think it's in real time, it's it's better. It drives me crazy some days because I sometimes have writer's block and I can't come up with a great title. Um, I'm trying to, actually, I really want to be on the, the I want to be the New York Post uh, uh, cover writer. He, they have the best covers. And so I'm, that's my long-term goal, I guess. Awesome. Uh, to, to do that. N that'll never happen, obviously, but uh, never I'm not, know. That smart. not that, I'm not that clever. <laughs> You're great. And uh, love your story. Um, three times a day is quite a bit. And it's very impressive because what I sense from hearing you say that is that you care. You genuinely, truly care to deliver the most current and up-to-date news. And you synthesize it so quickly because there's so many different parts and those moving parts are always moving. And to bring it current is very meaningful. Um, have you always written? Have you always been a writer? No, I haven't. I, I, I actually, I read a lot and I, 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 have really developed my writing skills um, over the years. And I, I use Grammarly, which a lot of people use that will definitely help with typing uh, and grammar mistakes. Uh, but it tells me how many words I write a year. And I'm like at two and a half million words a year that I'm typing. So these, these hands, they're really, they're, <laughs> they're good. And I, I went to, I went to an all boys Catholic school and they, they had a typing class and they had this, mean priest that would come around with a ruler and if you're looking at your keyboard <laughs> he'd hit you uh no joke that's a, that's a true story but yeah. I, I'm I, I can type fast wow impressive okay so you're a fantastic writer you synthesize all this great information based on market sentiment technical analysis fundamentals macro how did this all begin for you did you begin in the hedge fund world? Were you a trader? You were a technical analyst? When did you begin in this world? Well, we can go back way, way back. And um, I actually worked for a brokerage firm as an intern in the 80s. I started in, It's. I'll, I'll try and keep this one brief. Uh, in August of 87, I worked for a brokerage firm, a well-known one that uh, uh, is no longer around. Uh, but it was a very big one um, that well regarded. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I got a job as an intern doing, you know, I, I would get lunches for the brokers and cigarettes and I found Cuban cigars and, and other items that we can't talk about. Uh, so I was sort of a gopher guy, but then 87 happened. Wait, hold on. I should back up. My, my grandfather was a money manager and he was a metals trader way back. He owned silver mines and, you know, I still have a big bag of silver coins of his that's in, like, it's not worth that much. I mean, silver's not worth that much, but I still have it as a sort of a token of his 
his career. He he gave it to me. He's like, you take these. Then. Anyway, cool. my grandmother, my grandmother gave me $10,000 after he passed away. And I had no idea what to do with it. So I gave it to this like broker who, um, let's just say he, he, he drove a nice car and I had no idea, but he's like, oh, I got the greatest idea. And he basically bought puts in a biotech company. And I had no idea about options or anything. And like the first month I'm like, wow, I'm looking at my brokerage statement. It's like $6,000. What happened? He goes, well, it's okay. This is going to work. And cause the drug wasn't going to be approved and all this. And, uh, He's like, do you got more money? I'm like, no. <laughs> anyway, as it turned out, <laughs> the market crashed. This went up like 10x. So I was still in college, finishing college. And I had like sudden wealth, which was really cool. And I was like, I really like this trading thing. So I learned a lot and I, I started putting it into blue chip companies. I bought Microsoft and Apple and you know, still have those positions. Um, I wish... <laughs> But mm -hmm. I bought I bought good things. I learned and I learned um, a lot by making big mistakes. And uh, there are a lot of mistakes that uh, every investor makes along the way. And that's one thing that I try to help people avoid making big mistakes, leverage or sizing a position too big, uh, taking too much risk. Um, it it also um, so uh, so I'll, let me keep going. I I got a job finally at a brokerage firm. And I was like, like a cold caller and I hated it. I was so bad. And um, I, I I started working with a, a group at this one brokerage firm and um, I was one of their traders and, you know, do this, do that. And so I was pretty good at trading and I really started to learn about fundamentals. Uh, I, I learned a lot about technical analysis. And this is like right when the internet was starting to flourish and come on. And so I could... I just would absorb everything. And I, I worked for, um, at the time it was Smith Barney and uh, Louise Yamada and a guy named Alan Shaw were really their best technical analysts and they're still around, uh, really, really well regarded. And I just absorbed everything. And I thought to myself, I, I'm terrible at selling things, so I better be good at something. So analyzing how markets work, how stocks work, um, how to build a portfolio, I then got hired to work for I was hired to work for a hedge fund, a local hedge fund, which was a, a client, and I was their head trader. I did that for about a year and a half. This is right around 2000 when the markets were mm -hmm. blowing up. We did really, really well, um, and as it turned out, the firm went through some difficult times with their management. Uh, the CIO um, basically passed away. <laughs> And uh, I launched my own fund and I launched it uh, October 1st, 2001. And this is three weeks after 9-11. Mm. So it was really difficult raising capital. And I was in Los Angeles at the time. So I did that for a year with a partner. And basically, we couldn't raise any money. People in Los Angeles didn't know what a hedge fund was. Our performance was great. I got recruited to move to Connecticut. My wife is from the East Coast, so it was like a natural fit. Three daughters, let's go. Um, three daughters, two dogs, and uh, mm -hmm. here we are in Connecticut still. It worked out great. Um, it was a basic, uh, I worked for some uh, of the most talented uh, portfolio managers uh, and analysts, and this was a 100% first class operation, lots of capital. People wanted to give us as much money as they possibly could. Uh, we ran it for well, about 10 years and, and uh, I ran my own carve out portfolio there uh, as well, which was uh, pretty exciting. And uh, then it, it all ended uh, very quickly. Uh, we got caught up in a scandal. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And uh, it was, uh, it really hurt, hurt things um, financially for me and my life and, uh, we were sort of ensnared in the Steve Cohen insider trading mm. scandals that happened. Uh, at the end of the day, I had nothing to do with it uh, mm -hmm. or any of the problems. I, but one of our partners, uh, at the end of the day, was found exonerated from any wrongdoing. And uh, at that point, it's hard because you're sort of tainted uh, by working with a firm that uh, that 
went through this scandal and it it hurt so i really had to figure out things to do in my life and you know two months before all this happened i was being recruited by a ton of different firms saying would you you know want to come work for us and those same people I called them after and they're like, no, you're, you're toxic. We can't, we can't hire you. It was tough. And, um, but as it turns out, I, I have a lot of resilience. I love the markets. I stayed very involved in the markets. I I look at my screen. I looked at my screens every day and still traded my own stuff. Uh, But launching hedge fund telemetry in 2017 was really sort of one of those burn the boats type situation. I was on the island. I said, I'm burning the boat and I never looked back Mm -hmm. and I've just had the best time and connected with so many different people on so many different ways. And I hope that I'm making a positive difference for people and uh, helping them build portfolios, understand how a hedge fund manager thinks and trades and manages risks. I have, I'm very, very tight with uh, position sizing, uh, with stops and, and things like that. And I have a fundamental bent to things as well. I took level one CFA, passed it, never went back because I, again, I got hired to work for a hedge fund and it's, it's impossible to study uh, for CFA when you're mm-hmm. right in the middle of things. So um, that's kind of how my career progressed. And I, I think that it's like, Someone once said to me, never underestimate the power to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. And I did that. I took a leap of faith and it's really been, it's been great. Well, you are making a difference and just hearing your story. um, I think it was meant to be, you're, you're doing what you were meant to do and you are bringing all this amazing insider information Um, you know, insider, the way that the hedge funds use that information, you're synthesizing all these elements and you're allowing all investors to have access to it. And that's really important. You know, the the retail investor has been a disadvantage for many years. And so you're you're actually democratizing um, how to generate alpha uh, based on this valuable information that helps you gain an edge. And that's what it's about. You got to get that edge in the market. Um, you know, I believe challenges bring opportunities. And it seems that, you know, that that challenge that you faced um, brought you to where you are today. And we're so grateful to have you um, sharing your valuable information for all. Um, and you seem to be part of hedge fund history. Um, and I mean it in the kindest way, you know, with time provides wisdom. And you have so much experience. I'm so impressed. In the 80s, I can't help when you said 80s, I thought E.F. Hutton. I don't know why. I always think of that one um, back in that time period. <laughs> when E.F. Hutton talks, people listen. I know, so, right? You remember that? That was it. That's <laughs> a, that was a great slogan. I mean, Absolutely. You know, they, you know, they had the commercials for people that don't know, but they had this commercial where basically it's a um, in a restaurant and someone says, E.F. Hutton said, you know, and everybody's like yeah, listening. So <laughs> it's great. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the 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 business has changed a lot too. Um, you know, the technology that's been in, you know, that, that people have today, uh, the the retail investor has, has basically the same type of information that I have, um, that that I can get I look at a lot of stuff that the retail investor is looking at. Um I think that it's it, it it's wonderful. It's great. I I mean, we have Twitter. I mean, I couldn't. I I I started on Twitter in March of two thousand nine at the at the lows in the market, and uh, I will say that it's it's a vast um, opening for for finding out what's happening uh, in real time uh, around the world, and it's uh, everything is sped up so much faster and uh I, I i don't you know i don't look back and say oh i wish it wasn't so i like it everything very fast i like the changes in technology and i i embrace that type of change in technology and um the thing is though that i have a process uh i don't do certain things that other people do um i stick to my knitting and how I see things. And I look 
I look at market sentiment and I have data that, that uh, I've used for 20 plus years that will track that. I've made it even more special that with, on my site uh, with using certain charts. Uh, I look at um, uh, specific uh, technical analysis uh, called DeMarc indicators. And Tom DeMarc is this guy that um, he's really a genius. Uh, he created these indicators with uh, Larry Williams, who's another notable technician um, back in the pre-computer days. And he would put it all on paper and then, you know, and reams of paper that he used to talk about in his garage, the fire department would come and say, you got to get rid of these. But once computers started, he started to program them. And now these indicators are something I use every single day and they, mm. they spot trend exhaustion. So I feel comfortable buying when things are dropping really hard. I feel very comfortable if my indicators are telling me that we have a potential low here or potential high, I sell them and I'm long and short. Um, and I'm more, I'm probably more comfortable um, trading on the short side, um, mm -hmm. being net short in the market, uh, partly because the guys that I work with at my previous fund, uh, we were known for being a um, short biased firm. I mean, we weren't like activist shorts or anything like that. We just were able to spot ideas that worked well. Um, and they don't need to necessarily you know, crash and burn and go to zero. But if I can grab 10% on the downside on a stock, 20%, I'm really, really pretty happy about that. And so there's a lot of stuff that comes together. And one thing that I, I like to tell people, it's um, hedge funds, it's kind of like sausage. And, uh, you know, you love the taste of sausage. I, I, I do. Um, and you love the performance of a hedge fund but you really don't want to see how it's all all being made. You don't want to see how it, it goes in the grinder and it all comes out uh, because there's times where you have to take losses and you have to just pivot and say, okay, that's not working. And I'm, I'm gone. I try to teach people how to take a loss uh, in an elegant way. In other words, you don't have to, you know, think about it for more than a day. If you're sized right, you're not going to be losing your net worth. You're not going to lose your week or your month performance. It's just something that happens and you move on. I try to keep my winning percentage around 70% on all the trades that I do. Very nice. Well, there are quite a few excellent points there. I want to just start with the information point. Um, it's exactly right. Like you said, we have too much information. Everyone has access to so much information nowadays. However, it's being able to filter out that noise because there's quite a bit of noise and knowing what's important, what to focus on and what angle to gain that edge. So, cause we all have bandwidth constraint. And so we're in an information overload time period. It's very exciting time period we're in. Having it real time information available to us. I mean, we have the Fed speakers like talking to us all the time, right? I mean, it's it gets, they always have something to say, um, you know. <laughs> Maybe too much. <laughs> too much, right? I want to just like mute them a little bit. Um, but it's that sausage, like you said, um, it gets very complex. And that's what I love how you're able to synthesize and your formula. Um, well, that's what I'd like to talk about. Um, is your methodology that you use, the, the, the unique angle that you have based on all your experiences. Now you're an expert in market sentiment and it's it goes way long time ago, but it's deliberate practice and performing the same analysis for so many years. It's almost, I'm sure it's like almost like a gut feeling. You can just feel what feels right and how to view things. So I'd like to know in your mind, what is this methodology that you use um, besides this indicator you talked about when you put all this information together? What, what is it, how does it all come together to you? And that's a really good question. And I think I have a pretty basic answer. We love and, simplicity, we love it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a big fan of simplicity and uh, 
the, one of the things that I, I, I look for, and I have a lot of different technical indicators. I look at internals, the percentage of stocks above the 20 day moving average and the 50 day moving average within the S&P. And I generally stick to large cap stocks as my go-to. Uh, and just because of where I was, we needed, you know, the most liquid stock. So it just, I, I can understand them. I understand the sectors and such, but so I, I stick to a pretty narrow universe. I don't necessarily um, move from, you know, the stock of the day to something new the next day. I tend to know my sectors and I know the sectors that I'm best mm -hmm. in. Um, so there's that. But since I look at so many different technical indicators, uh, what I like to see when I have a bottom and I, I look at market sentiment when it gets washed out, um, you can look back in history and say, well, if all of these indicators were down here when we bought them the last time, and I have about 25 that I look at, they're, if they're all down here and these are doing the same things that happened the last time, and it took a couple of weeks or a week or two or whatever for things to turn, uh, that's probably a good buying opportunity. It's the same thing on the upside as well. And it's harder to, to pick tops and I've, I've picked tops and I pick bottoms and um, I'm right, I'm wrong. I generally get it pretty right. I've been a, I've been wrong on a, on a few, few times um, in recent years with just being a little early on the short side. I was a little early early in the short side in uh, 2021. Nothing, you know, terrible, but it all worked out. Um, actually, yeah, that was fine. But I look for things that happen together. And mm -hmm. sometimes they're, they're, un, they're not necessarily all the same technical indicators. It could be sentiment. It could be different things. I mean, like you, one person could look, a retail person could look at the CNN fear and greed uh, indicator and look at market sentiment when it gets washed out or it's elevated. And sentiment, really important because a lot of people will, will hike or they'll talk about market sentiment alone, standing alone. And that's not necessarily true because sentiment can stay overbought or oversold for a period of time. It's when you want to see other types of indicators that, that come into the mix. And that's why the DeMarc indicators for me work so well because they're really dynamic and they're very sharp. And they can honestly pinpoint um, a turn in the stock. And it's not necessarily that if it's, it's something's been going down, you know, the smart, the smart buyers come in. It's actually the last seller has sold at the highs. It's the last buyers bought and then it, it can come down or stall. And so I look at, I look at all these different things and I want to see things happen together. And this year has been a little bit tricky because last year, had a really good year because we had these really good swings. And this year has been sort of this, this trend up in the NASDAQ and that's been a very narrow advance. And I have on my Bloomberg, I can show, uh, I do it all the time. I, I look at the attribution from a current of a, a period. So year to date in the NASDAQ 100, there's about five stocks that have attributed about 60% of the total gain. Just those those stocks, and you know who they are. They're the Apples, Amazons, Tesla, Nvidia. You know, you can look at the, a few others in there that have done a lot of the heavy lifting. So that makes it a little trickier because then your performance, you're like, well, you know, if if I just was in those, it would be just is super easy. But now those are getting very extended, and so I'm looking at them as shorts, and I'm I'm short some of them right now. But the 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 point is, um, I I can I try to combine a lot of different technical indicators and and market uh, internals, and um, managing them, you know, and knowing through experience of what to weigh higher at certain periods mm -hmm. um, is important. And there's not every time that I can get hundred percent of all of them working perfectly together. That that just that's that's a dream and that almost makes me a little bit more skeptical. Um, but if I can get about 70% of the indicators starting to line up as a buy, uh, um, I, I'll, I'll then start to add some new buying, you know, some new long positions. 
It's the same thing on the upside uh, as well. So I, I try to do that. I, I build portfolios where I, I don't like to have more than 20% uh, max of one sector in the in the portfolio. Uh, at inception, I don't ever have more than five percent um, of the total weight of the portfolio in one stock. Uh, and a lot of times, I'll I'll start with two percent, a two percent size position. And a lot of people will say, "Well, oh, that's not going to get you that far." But if you do it enough, it adds up. And it also here here's another thing. I, I'm really very much human, and I'm those people that say, "Oh, you you have to take all your emotion out of the the, the equation." You know, no emotion. Mm -hmm. I I'll tell you, I I get my stomach goes. I you know I get anxiety. I I have a lot of different things that will trigger me, but I also use that as a vital tool to know that when I'm feeling anxious or something, maybe I have too much of this position on. Um, and, and, and keeping my position size is actually very good for your anxiety. Mm -hmm. You can let you, you're not going to be looking at it and watching every tick and saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You, it gives you some sort of freedom to allow it to breathe a little bit in the direction that you want it to go. And if it's, if it moves in the wrong direction, you can widen your stop a little. So you don't just get shaken out immediately on something. And that's, that's something that I uh, that I've learned that just works for me. And you know, other people will will concentrate their positions. You know, they'll have five positions, and that's it. You know, we want to make make sure it works. But that's too much for me. And I think everybody, I I guess I could say, within what I do, people sort of gravitate and learn, and maybe they'll pick something that I I do, and they'll use it for their process. Because everybody's process is going to be different because it's their personality and their anxiety level. And I mean, I know some really, really very smart hedge fund people uh, that, that get completely anxious on different things. And, you know, it, it's it's OK. It's OK to get that that anxiety and, and knots in your stomach. And uh, there, there's times where I've, I've loaded the boat long on, on things with the markets are, are down. Um, I mean, for example, I uh, one good example um, when COVID hit, and this was like like third week of March. All my indicators were starting to say, "Hey, this is you know we didn't know what was going on. We're all getting locked up in our houses, and I didn't know what was going on." But all my indicators were, were just flashing green. They were just so overdone. Uh, market sentiment that I look at from zero to a hundred was at three. Uh, three percent bulls, and I started buying everything I could. I was on a few webinars with people, and they were like, "We're going into the depression and everything," and it started to started to rebound uh, within a couple of weeks. Uh, obviously, the Fed and you know the, what they did, mm -hmm. uh, you know, certainly helped. But the 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 situation was that the setup was there, and I just needed to be patient and let things things work uh, and it's worked the same way on the on the upside so there's times where i'll be i'm i'm set up really really short right now um with a lot of tech and i'm long energy so it's those are sort of a little theme i have right now but it, it it's um it's really about a process that you can live with and building that takes time takes experience and you don't really learn from winning you learn from losing and you want to write stuff down and say, don't do that again. That's kind of how I like to, uh, I like to look at things. Very wise words there. There's so much knowledge in what you said, and I agree with all of it. I mean, having traded um, for many years and experiencing many bear market cycles, um, you know, we learn from our losses and we've all had them. And I've had many losses, you know, I'm here to admit it, you know, um, and it's through those difficult times that we learn the most and they build character and risk management is number one. And I think it reminds us that when we take those losses and we should take them gracefully. And it's about how quickly we can recover after taking those losses. That's true success. And it's about letting them roll off your back and not reacting impulsively. Emotions are good. 
I have a focus in decision sciences, behavioral economics. So I always talk about emotions and I always like to clear up the air then say, emotions are normal. We're human. We're not robots, you know, and they tell us about ourselves. They give us good information. It's about not reacting impulsively. It's about controlling that reaction from those heightened emotions. And as you said, reduce position sizing. That's my motto. And more than ever, especially in volatility in this market. And, you know, it helps not only reduce risk, but also helps reduce those heightened emotions. You can sleep better at night and you don't react so anxiously. And yes, anxiousness can be part of someone's personality. And sometimes being anxious helps people perform better. You know, so it depends on the person. And just like you said, trading depends on your personality, your style and how you are. And I learned the most about myself through trading. So um, it's an amazing thing. I think trading is amazing. I think we're all passionate about it and we all share that love. Um, and um, I think it's amazing that you're you're such so amazing at short. I mean, that's an art in itself. A lot of people I talk to are like, oh, I don't I don't know about the short side. But um, that's awesome. And I, I also think tech is overextended right now. So the short position to me seems to make a lot yeah, of sense. It's, it's not easy. I mean, it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy sometimes shorting like the most loved stocks mm -hmm. out there. Uh, it's not necessarily something I just I, I gravitate towards doing. And there, there's another thing. I, I, I try to avoid the obvious. And so, for example, there's... NVIDIA is up almost 100% this year. Oh. And so I have my DeMarc exhaustion signals that are occurring. There's a lot of technical stuff happening. You know, very elevated RSI on the daily and weekly. And I can look at it and say, also, I look at short interest. I'm a real mm -hmm. uh, believer in looking at individual short interest and put call data for individual stocks. And so you've had you have very, very low short interest in NVIDIA and anybody that's been short this whole way up, they've covered, they've moved on, they're, mm -hmm. they're gone. And so I want to find stocks that I'm going to short that have relatively low short interest. And the other thing what I want to do is I want to find stocks that besides low short interest that have a very high call buying. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people will remember... Um, you know, the people on CNBC, and I don't watch CNBC as well, by the way. I um I haven't watched CNBC for a couple of years. Me either. And it, that's a mental, yeah, it's a, it Noise. clears your head because it's, we're talking about the day, you know, what's happening today. And I want to find out what's happening. You know, I, I, I watch Bloomberg because they talk about more than just, you know, the stock of the day. They talk about mm -hmm. currencies and I commodities like and, and rates and everything. So I, I think you're going to get a better um, if you're really interested in the markets or you want to hear about Hampton's home prices, you can go on CNBC. But <laughs> yeah, it's Bloomberg's more entertainment. Been very, very good for me. And, um, I like Yeah, Bloomberg. it's like I'm not buying a house in the Hamptons. I know. We know they're high. We know they're high prices. <laughs> the yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. Well, who it's cares? entertainment. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to watch the lifestyle. Well, I mean, famous. here's one yeah. clue. But, Jim um, Cramer, right? Jim well, Cramer is the oh, ultimate well. entertainer and he's CNBC. <laughs> Yeah, I you know I've met Jim a couple times, and uh, one of my friends, uh, he has the inverse uh, Kramer <laughs> ETF. <laughs> but uh, I you know I I don't I don't dislike Jim Kramer. Um, I and I, when I met him, I found him to be really engaging and and very very nice. Yeah. And he said, you know, we're I, part of my job is to entertain and and educate. Um, you know, my my view is that I think he. He does. He's not a, as accountable for himself, and I, I think accountability is is really important. Like, oh God, I just I botched that one up. And I I I actually <laughs> love when I have to take. I don't love, but I I I should say I feel some sort of relief when I have to go on my you know my note and say, yeah, I'm going to take a loss in this one. We're gonna we're gonna move on. And uh, I hate taking losses, but it also frees up your mental capacity yes. so you're not looking at this thing all day going mm -hmm. you know it's like awful but um the thing is as far as just one th more thing as far as when you see heavy call buying mm -hmm. uh, it typically happens 
late into a move uh, on a stock or an ETF. And when you see heavy put buying, it's the opposite. It's mm -hmm. and, and since we have so much option trading these days, I think that it's really, really invaluable to look at how the option traders are setting up on how, for a particular stock. If you can find the data intraday, I think, or you know, day to day, I think it's really important because um, you don't want to be buying with um, the people buying calls in it. That's not, you know, that was the old school thing like oh they're buying calls and this special thing like it's going to get bought out that's the chances of a stock getting bought out because of high call buying is so low these days mm -hmm. uh, the stock getting bought out is very low because of the regulatory issues but the point is you want to fade those you want to fade those people because they are positioned long and if it doesn't work they're going to have to sell those options or they go worth worthless and then the dealers so there's there's option dealers that have to delta hedge when they sell you an option they have to buy stock a percentage of the delta of what they see as what it's worth and if it goes up they have to buy more so that's a whole nother topic but if it doesn't work and the stock drops those dealers have to sell stock um, as their hedge against those options that uh, expire worthless and so that's something I watch. I, I like to see when shorts get taken out. Um, I, I am a short seller um, and I've, I've learned from great people. So we try to wait for those those people to exit uh, and and have very low short interest. Because um, then, then if there's news and it's not good news, um, the potential for it to drop up is, is higher because you don't have the natural buyer. You don't have the shorts in there that are going to buy it and uh, and limit the downside because you know generally speaking if you're in a stock that's been going up and and there's bad news it'll drop this much because mm -hmm. and the shorts will cover because it's like oh my god let's just you know it's like you know it's, they just won the lotto uh, when they mm -hmm. they get to cover a short at a profit especially one that's been going up for a while. Excellent points, and I want to reiterate that point about call buying because I. I mean, I love economics and I know macro is the backdrop for everything. And at the heart of everything is supply and demand. And it's about buyers and sellers. And that that's what makes up the market. And your process and your strategy is very interesting. So you look at the options flow, correct? And you look for mm -hmm. unusual options flow because there's a lot of flow out there. And a lot of it is no, noise. I, I, I actually, I, everybody wants to find an unusual options flow. I don't. I, I know I and I it, it, I'll tell you why. I like to Alice. see I like to see a stock that that's this is this is like anatomy of a, how I would find a short idea. Mm -hmm. Find a stock that's gone up excessively, uh valuation is high, um, there's heavy call buying, and mm -hmm. short interest has been declining on this rise. So if I, and then I I will basically use the trigger of a DeMarc exhaustion signal. And basically I screen, I can, I have the tools that I can screen every S&P 500 stock or Euro stock 600 uh, stock and look for a specific DeMarc exhaustion signal. They don't always work. Um, and you, since I've used them for more than 20 years, I, I know the probability of when they're most likely to work and when I want to not use that particular signal. And, it, and again, it has to, there's has to be a combination of a, of, of a few things, but that's kind of the anatomy of how I would look for a short idea. Um, because I, I want to, I want to get the people that have just come into the stock. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go up anymore. And they're going to be like, well, wait a minute, this isn't working. And I want to get there if you trigger your finger to sell it um, and move on to the next the next one. Uh, but that generally is how I will look for a short idea. And it's it's almost the, the same, the opposite for um, for buying buying along. Um, it is essentially. So then you would look for the put buying along with I like to find days. heavy put buying. Um, and the other thing is I like to see power in numbers. So I like to see a lot of DeMarc signals. If I start to see a lot of sell signals, uh, for example, 
uh, we had a lot of DeMarc cell signals uh, in December 2021. And that was after that big run. And it wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. just on daily. It was on weekly as well, which was telling me that we were getting set up for a more intermediate term move lower. So I found that to be important when I get a, when I get many of them. If I get 30% of the entire S&P 500 were giving me these signals, I knew that something was coming to the downside. Um, and that's just through the experience of what I do. And um, I want to find, currently, someone asked me today, they said, what will make you turn bullish? Okay. I want to see many, many, many to mark buy signals on the downside and 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 one-offs are not necessarily that interesting to me i want to see a lot of them happening and a lot of them sometimes happening in one sector so for example we just had a lot of energy buy signals so i bought energy and those are up you know 10 percent off off the low so that's that's worked um and a lot of the stuff washed out on the downside and and uh, I, again, I don't watch CNBC, but I know that um, they get real doom and gloom when things, you know, turn south. One other funny thing is that you can always look at like personal sentiment things that happen. You can see when the Drudge Report posts something where they'll have, you know, the market crashed and stuff like that, or, you know, talking about Elon Musk, the richest man in the world and, and all these like, you can use those as a sentiment thing. Again, I like the CNN fear and greed. I think that's really, really good. It's not saying what people are saying about the markets, what they're doing, with the indicators that they use. I think it's it's, it's really pretty good. Um, but also, like it used to be, like you'd see the the guy from the New York Stock Exchange, you know, going like this, you know, <laughs> and if it's on the front page of a newspaper or the top story in the in on the nightly news, uh, it's pretty good. I mean, one example, and I, I have a daughter who's who is in college and she's out now, but she was in college during the GameStop thing when mm -hmm. it was going up. And she's a film student and she calls me and she says, dad, what's going on with this GameStop? <laughs> I'm like, what, what are you talking about? She's never talked to me about a stock in her life. She's, she's She'd actually be pretty good at what, what I do. <laughs> but uh, she's like, I see these kids in my class and they're on their phones trading it. I'm like, yeah, exactly. It was on the nightly news here in New York area. Uh, it was on the, you know, the, all the news channels and it was on the front page. Uh, and that was basically the top when it's all talked about and mm -hmm. it's going up and people are making tons of money. Um, it's over. It's absolutely over. And and on the other hand, when things are, you know, it's, dire out there um that's generally when i tell people that are not market professionals yeah you probably want to you probably want to start buying when it seems like the, the scariest and uh, because generally if the news is starting to come on and it's like oh my god the banks are crashing and you're gonna lose all your money it's probably a good idea to start looking at the at buying things because it gets overdone that's when put buyers come in exactly right and, and and put buyers will have to reverse themselves if it lifts so it's just it's yeah you simple. get that you get that whole pattern it's a you know it's expertise decision expertise based intuitive decision making which is basically pattern matching you see those patterns and you match them against recognizable prototypes in your head from seeing them from so many years of doing this and so that's so valuable um, your research and your expertise allows you to make more accurate judgments to maximize the expected value of your choices. So like you said, it's not 100%. There's no such thing as 100% in the world. Um, but you do have a 70%, which very impressive, uh, based on your experience. Um, thank you so much for going into your mind and what you see when you go long versus short. Um, very, very interesting stuff. So let's take what you all, what you said. I know you say you're short tech and you're long energy. Let's apply though the DeMarc indicators and the sentiment, the technical to what you're seeing right now in the markets. 
What is your general feeling on the markets, all the indexes and sectors right now overall? Okay, how can I start? Uh, I think technology is overdone on the upside. And I think that you can look at semiconductors and historically semiconductors don't do well in recessions. And if we move towards a Mm -hmm. recession, uh, that means less semiconductors out there that are needed. Um, there's still a lot of inventory of semiconductors out there. Um, I think the technology world is a little spooky because yesterday they talked about Apple. Their PC sales um, are down 40%. Uh, that was a story that was going around. I've also heard that uh, you know just other desktop sales are down. And remember, if we start to see unemployment, that means fewer people are going to be buying mm-hmm. phones and laptops and, you know, companies aren't, the enterprise isn't, isn't buying um, more of this stuff. So you're going to see slowdown, but the market hasn't really respected that. They, they, they just, oh, let's, we got to keep buying AMD and, and mm-hmm. Nvidia and, you know, it's the greatest stock in the world. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure technology, um, it, it could certainly change, um, uh, change tomorrow. Um, uh, but mm-hmm. I manage my risk and I'm not dogmatic in the sense that I can't do something. Mm-hmm. So from the sense of the sentiment, it's actually been kind of an interesting year. Um, I, we track, uh, S and P and NASDAQ and the S and P sentiment, um, uh, has been actually very depressed. It's been depressed versus the NASDAQ. And the delta between those was extraordinarily, unusually wide. And that's starting to narrow. And I think that's because the NASDAQ is starting to cool off a little. Uh, and the S&P with some of the other sectors, materials were good today. Energy's been really good. Uh, industrials are okay. Healthcare has been good. Mm-hmm. Defensive stuff uh, has been has been pretty good. The healthcare has been pretty pretty solid. Um, so that's narrowed, and I'd say sentiment is right in the middle of the road right now. Mm-hmm. And we we score it between if you're basically it's a survey: are you bullish or bearish? And if you have a hundred people, um, the percentage is either you know you're fifty percent of half and half and half. Um, what I like to see is when when sentiment gets up to let's say the 90% level. And that's super bullish. Everybody loves the market. Uh, that's an extreme. And if we're, again, like March of 2020, um, it was at 3% bulls. So those are extreme levels. Um, so we're right in the middle right now. It muddles it up a little bit. doesn't make it easy. Uh, but we do have some exhaustion signals with the DeMarc indicators within the NASDAQ. There's a couple that I'd like to still see trigger but we're close enough to where i can say i think that there's tech stocks and microsoft adobe nvidia amd i'm short intel again um they're great companies but i'm just they're overdone i mean i like to say you know people are long those and they're like oh i hate that guy but it's just technical it's not personal (laughs) exactly (laughs) i'm I'm watching that um as far as energy it's had a nice run off the lows, the recent lows. And energy historically is not great going into a recession, but it's a little different because we have an inflation problem. And the Biden administration um, has released the SPR, the oil release, which has depressed the price of crude and gasoline. Uh, I'm not political. I, for the record, I hate both political parties. Um, sort of long rationality and that's mm-hmm. that hasn't been really part of the no, political discourse of of the uh, last few years but uh so i i like energy from the sense that if they have to start refilling the spr which they will have to do that mm-hmm. eventually um uh, they wanted to do it when crude was in the 60s and now it's at 80 uh that's wti mm-hmm. and so they're they're going to get caught out on that. And not that we necessarily need, we have an emergency issue with, um, with the crude. Uh, but I think the, the energy companies have managed their business better this time around. And I think the OPEC uh, countries are 
playing a bit hardball as well. And so they're going to cut production. And that will probably coincide with higher prices. Uh, I don't see demand dropping that much right now. I mean, it's people are still flying and driving and it's 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 you, you haven't seen really demand issues uh, with the data. But there's the risk of this starting to increase again. And again, I think the energy companies uh, have managed their business pretty well. Uh, even the natural gas providers have, have done a pretty good job uh, at navigating natural gas going from 10 to 2. So uh, that's pretty extreme. Um, so I think that there's there's opportunities there. And there could be mergers uh, in that, mm -hmm. although regulatory um it's that's going to be a tough one to get over the goal line because uh, the Biden administration is really, really not favorable. They're not very favorable to energy companies and they're not going to be favorable to mergers as well of any sort. So mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's tricky, but I think that they, those have some opportunity. I do like some material stocks as well. Um, I think there's there's uh, opportunity in steel like U.S. Steel and mm -hmm. uh, Report, Macmoran, um, Alcoa. What else am I playing around with these days? Uh, I'm short Tesla. This has been mm -hmm. a long term short for me. I don't, um, I'm not dogmatic. I didn't get um, run over um, the other year, the other year when it <laughs> ran up like crazy, but I picked my spots and I think I've traded it about 15 times in the last five years. And I have a pretty good record uh, as far as knowing when to cover and get out. And um, I think that uh, there's a big problem there uh, with demand. And that I think is a theme that's happening, that's mm -hmm. going to be happening and seen through their earnings season that we're going into right now. Demand is dropping off. That mm -hmm. happens when the Fed raises rates. That's typically, um, what you see going into recession, uh, but you know that stock trades at a valuation that is worth more than the, most of all the other um, legacy automakers' market cap combined. So there's no valuation um, rationality with this company. I think Elon Musk is untrustworthy. Um, I think that's he's proving that every day on Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, it's it's really been my main thesis is about demand dropping off, and there's other there's other electric vehicles, and I'm a car guy, so mm -hmm. you know, I, I like cars. Uh, but I don't I don't think Teslas are are good looking cars. They look like refrigerators, mm -hmm. and um, I like you know Porsches and BMWs. Me and too. Porsche. We have good taste in cars, so I yeah. agree with you that I don't think the Tesla X model is. That it looks like a Prius to me. No offense. I know everyone's going to get mad now, but um, I don't find it a very particularly sexy car. I'm a, I'm a 911 person um, and the GTS type, you know, I like the really nice um, vehicles. Yeah, but that's good. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, um, so I saw a Rivian today and I took a picture and I tweeted it and I've been seeing, you know, there's Lucid, there's so many competitors. So you have lower demand because of inflation, you know, um, we have lower growth, all that. And then interest you have rates are high. It's yes. hard. To, it's hard to afford a $60,000 car and, and they're lowering prices. Uh, that's mm -hmm. I, there's never competitors. My, there are other competitors yeah, I mean, now. I didn't learn that in CFA about uh, when you lower prices that it's positive for a company. It's generally going to so you, you have to, it's going to hurt your margins. Absolutely. And, uh, margins are most important is margins in the bottom and, line. Yeah. And, and look, I think that, um, you know, I'm not, I, I think that they, they've sort of saturated the market. Uh, they, they, they built two new factories. I mean, they built two factories heading into a recession and they're building the same cars that they've been making. They're, they're kind of stale. They haven't really done any changes um, of note other than, you know, putting a different, iPad on the dashboard um, <laughs> and changing the bumpers. So look, I think they're a little stale and for a premium mm -hmm. valuation company, you should be crushing it. They should be doing so much better. And I think it's just a poorly managed company uh, that that if they had, a mar if 
th there was a German company that that had a similar market cap and domination and and lead time. It would be they would be putting out cars every two years and and crushing it. I just think that the, that it's an unfocused CEO. Um, he's now focused on being on Twitter all day mm -hmm. and hey, to each his own. That's, that's fine. That's mm -hmm. his, his thing, but it's, it's running a company and it's a really complex business because there's a lot of moving parts. There's logistics that I've heard horror stories about with them. Uh, the service isn't great. So I'm short the stock. Um, I currently have a profit in it um, of 20% and I have a full position in the 5% short position uh, going into earnings. And, you know, something it's, um, there's a lot of companies that will get a free pass. And this is one, you know, when, when you're a premium valuation, you should be crushing earnings and absolutely destroying the competition. And I, I, I just, I look at this dumb cyber truck that looks like <laughs> I, something I drew when I was six with crayons and, it, it it's it's almost like the emperor's new clothes because all the tesla fans were like oh my god it's gonna be so great and i'm like I, i've seen ugly cars before and then there's this and it just it doesn't make any sense to me and economic sense either i don't think they're going to sell a lot of them and yeah. i think anybody driving one is going to be sort of embarrassed the rivian's a cool car that's rivian. a cool car yeah but I, I did hear about a, one of my subscribers told me that he bought a Rivian and he flipped it. He sold it. And uh, he just said that it, there were some some issues with it. He thinks the company's just not there yet. And and look, that's it's a new company. It's a mm -hmm. brand new car. Uh, so those are bound to happen. Um, again, I'm a Porsche and BMW person. I like Mercedes. Mercedes, I like. That's a, I, I have. Rovers and Range yeah. Rovers and all the, those. But uh yeah, so that's that's I'm short that. What else? Next. Well, I have to tell you, I'm going to chime in. The theme overall, I'm a fundamentalist, so um, you know the theme has been move to value, and by value, we're looking for real assets, real numbers, real cash. We these these high valuation companies, like you mentioned, I think uh, I think they're overextended, and I think that you know in the time period of compressed margins. OK, and earnings are deteriorating. You know, I believe that we are missing an earning recessions just upon us. You know, um, it's inevitable. You know, um, we have new fees. We have come We have higher cost of goods and services, higher interest rates, which lead to higher costs of debt and capital. A lot of these companies are re relying on constant refinance to get that capital. And it's at a much higher rate. Um, you know, and that's going to get factored in in time. It's only going to get worse. And I think we're in a higher for longer. Um, I think that we had too much free money and negative rates, which is what led to the issues and the banking crisis is a symptom of that. And, um, you know, I, I just think that the times are changing. I think it's a new regime and I think higher valuations need to come down. Plus the risk free rate is the highest it's been since pre GFC. So, I mean, now the earnings risk, the equity risk premium is like the narrowest it's been in all this time. So, you know, technically, you know, the, the S&P um, and NASDAQ are, are, are expensive. You know, the earnings yield is lower than the risk-free rate. So, um, you know, why put your money you're in right. unless, unless you're getting compensated? You're right. I, right? I, and look, I've been through, I've been through a bunch of different cycles and I think that, uh, like I I I I go down the YouTube rabbit hole every so often, uh, a little too often. I, I watch a lot of the Warren Buffett speeches and yeah. anything I can watch that he has to to say. And you know, as much as much as people will say, well, he's not he's not with it, and he doesn't really, <laughs> you know, he's not buying Nvidia. You know, he bought Apple, and his his he bought a lot of Apple, and his yield of what he's getting from Apple is extraordinary. And it just runs, it runs off cash for him. Mm. And so I like, to, you know, and, and this is like one thing that that's really important. Um, let's say the market does get walloped. Um, the first thing that I recommend everybody do is to upgrade your quality. And that, and that's really, really important. 
So if you missed Apple on the way up and it, and it goes down 50%, and I know people will say, oh, Apple can never go down 50%. I've seen Apple go down 50% 10 times in my career. Uh, so that's the time where you want to upgrade your, your mm -hmm. portfolio, portfolio quality. Um, those are the things. That's where I start. Just mm -hmm. go there. Look for companies that have pretty solid business. You know, you, you want to understand solid the business. business. You want, to, you want to see some sort of uh, earnings yield. Um, you want to have, uh, a, if there's a dividend, you know, go for it. You want to have that. Um, and then, you know, you can then layer in the outside of the, the core uh, a little bit more speculation. But you want to keep your sizing down on those. And But th that's that's generally how I like to, what I tell people when, when things fall out of bed when things are just absolutely horrible this is the opportunity to buy all the things you want to buy i mean mm -hmm. I, I i actually have bought i bought nvidia and and meta like at the recent lows i i kind of got squeezed i took them off a little early uh with gains but you know i did i i took a 20 percent gain on nvidia or something and i thought oh that's awesome but uh, um now it's up 100 percent. so you know, if my worst crime is selling too early and taking a profit, okay. well, I'd rather tell, I'd rather sell too early than too late, right? Yeah, that's that's <laughs> exactly it. So, and and again, it's also important as you start to, if you have a winner and it's working, and if it's a trade, to trim a little, uh, which will also lower your anxiety level. Uh, nothing, mm -hmm. nothing. Uh, you know, that's that's something that I, I strongly recommend. Mm -hmm. One other thing that a little tidbit tidbit, I always get people mm -hmm. and I, I get emails all day. So I've got an I got a profit, Tom, in X, Y, Z mm -hmm. and earnings are coming next week and I'm not sure what I should do. OK, so I, I, I run this question and this dilemma in my head mm -hmm. all the time. And so what I tend to do whenever I have that is I sell half. I just sell half. Yeah. I just took a profit on half and I'm either going to be half right or half wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it keeps going up, it's, it's still working. I'm still making money, but if it goes down, I can look at it and say, well, I've adjusted my cost basis basically to, you know, weather some of the storm. If I still like it, I can buy more. I can buy it back. Uh, and just having that mental flexibility uh, is so important. And, and there's so many times I hear people that, oh, I sold some of it and it went up 10% after earnings. It's like, so you still have some, you know, who yeah. cares? I mean, taking a profit is, is, is important, but you don't necessarily have to get the top tick. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's like, you know, oh, I, I left some on the table. I wish I never sold. I don't look <laughs> back ever. And I traded a billion, I, more than a billion shares a year when I worked at my hedge fund. And if I looked back and said, oh, I wish I didn't do that, I, I would drive myself crazy. So that's that's important. It's keeping that flexibility and, and not beating yourself up if you sold too early and took profit, you know, God, God forbid. You know. I know, right? You know, and mindset is like 80%, I think. It's the psychology. It's that whole thing that you just spoke about. And this comes from experience. And, you know, going through it and experiencing it, we're able to help others. But I'm a scale in, scale out kind of person. I always take profits on the way up. And you know what? So be it. I missed that last run. Or, hey, I, I could have saved myself from taking and let green go to red. So um, and I always believe in doing that. Or... You can do options around that position as well, like sell covered calls, or you do like a, a collar, or you know, the, you buy a protective put, you know, you could do stuff like that as well. You can get creative, right. um, but there's so many options. But yeah, I mean, the last thing I worry about, especially in this market, is that I miss the, that little upside. You know, if I'm going to kick myself over, I mean, I got bigger problems than that. You know, there's other things like that yeah, can happen I, worse, I right? totally agree. I, I, I will... Oftentimes in my own portfolios, I will I will sell covered calls, mm, and me too. I I also sell puts uh, I against that. my shorts, mm -hmm. and you know what's the worst that can happen? You take a profit. I mean, I I yeah, and I and I I will say that I'm working at my hedge fund. I remember many many times where 
someone would we'd sell calls against something and it would go up over the strike and they'd be all upset like oh we should buy them back I'm like just let it go you know just you made your bet mm -hmm. you're taking a profit what's the problem here you can always buy it back tomorrow after expiration exactly. i i always i i'm always like you gotta just have that that sort of flexibility flexibility that's and, it and if you're wrong if you're wrong in this in something you can take it off you you can always look back and try and do it again but a lot of times people will do this revenge trade you know mm -hmm. oh i lost money in this i gotta get back, back in there immediately and make money i think the market sometimes is telling you that maybe it's time to take a break from doing that one mm -hmm. stock you know maybe move on to another uh or do something you know look somewhere else let that one do its thing because you've been wrong and don't look back and you know move on you know there's there's stocks that i've banned from ever trading again and you know I, i'll never trade chipotle again <laughs> I, I i hate that stuff <laughs> but i like i like going there but you know i won't yeah. trade the stock anymore it's just it's too it's too volatile in times for me and i don't need that in my life but yeah know thyself know what works and what you don't it's, like it's really it's really important too it's like i i i used to play a lot I used, when i lived in california i'd go to las vegas all the time and this is like college and i i i, I played on my mac um to college a um, blackjack game so i was really into it and i and i met edward thorpe who lived in mm -hmm. newport beach where i lived and i was like oh my god so i i learned all this stuff about blackjack and gambling and all this and it's all risk management sizing is everything so mm -hmm. if you come in and you put all your money down on the first hand you're either going to make money or you're going to lose money but if you could just take slices mm -hmm. and just keep going and doing that mm -hmm. it's so important and i went with a friend to vegas recently and he lost he he was i and i don't drink when i'm gambling i, I mm -hmm. that's just that's why give yeah. yourself a limitation it's like yeah right. why do you, uh, i should give yourself a I'm handicap drinking while i'm trading you know like yeah. oh yeah <laughs> no so my friend was like having a good time and he was losing money next to me and he's like my wife's gonna kill me and i'm like okay let's i'll get you back and i was making money this is my my process of how i play blackjack sort of like how i trade so i i made him back his money but he was like the type that like he lost you know he lost 400 dollars. so he's like I, i'm gonna i'm gonna put you know 200 down on the next one i'm like no you can't no. <laughs> you, you just 25 dollars. just let's chip away and we'll make mm -hmm. it anyway we made him back his money his wife didn't divorce and we had a nice you know fun weekend all good. of us that's good um, but that's sort of the the thing don't grudge don't try and get your money back on one trade you know that's that's a that's a common mistake people do um sometimes it's better to walk away from a table and and a stock absolutely it is that kenny rogers song about know when to fold them when to hold them when to walk away yeah. you know that song right and yeah. i always think of that um with trading and it's no revenge trading, no fear of missing out. When you feel that rush, like that feeling that I have to go back, I have, when you feel that feeling, you know that you need to stop because intuition and, you know, skill is, is actually calm and you need to be calm. And if you feel that rush, then you just know that something's off. So you got to stop yourself and, yeah. um, you know, cause it'll be there. And if you miss it, so be it. But the point is, you don't want to rush and then take a big loss. And that's well, what how, we want to avoid. How about this? How about, think about Warren Buffett. Okay. A, he wants to make money with every mm -hmm. idea he has. He he goes into it. I want to make money. He's 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 a very nice, you know, all shucks type of guy, but he's a shark. Mm -hmm. He wants oh, to make money. Yeah. And he's going to bend over people. Oh, sorry if that's PG. Um, it's fine. It's good. It's great he's going to basically get the best terms of how he enters mm -hmm. a particular position. He's ruthless. He, yeah. Yes. So he wants to make money, but here's the, the thing. He doesn't need to make money. He doesn't need to make money to pay his bills. 
he doesn't need to make money to sharpen, you know, mm -hmm. freshen his ego boost. Mm -mm. No, he just goes in and does his process, finds what he wants. And he always says, you know, he waits for, you know, there's a lot of pitches out there. He doesn't, he just waits for his pitch and mm -hmm. he doesn't necessarily need to do anything. He hasn't done anything really significantly mm -hmm. for several years, except for buying Occidental, which I am long. Um, <laughs> if that ever gets into the fifties, just buy it. <laughs> just, mm. just buy like it. He's gonna, he's gonna buy the entire company one day. But that's the key. I, I know a lot of people that are day traders and they need to make money to over the years I've met people they need to make money to survive they get into options they blow themselves up because they're trying too hard they need it if you just want to do it and you have a process it makes it a lot easier you just i want to make money i come in every day and i say i want to make money you don't need to like to i'm gonna do my best to mm -hmm. and i try to explain that that it's um it's sort of the need and want absolutely if you need to make money in the market you won't. Exactly. Absolutely. That's exactly, I agree completely. It's like a whole psychology with that. It's like, when, you know, you need to focus on the process and you need to love the process. And it's, it's when you forget about making the money that somehow it comes. But when you're focused just on making that money, it's like, it seems like it never comes. And I um, agree with you on all that. Um, you know, Occidental, I just want to jump in with that. There was some great news that came out today. Did you see that they're selling credits for like carbon neutral or something like for carbon, like for, did you yeah. see that? I was like, wow, how smart. Like that seems like a great company. And I was going to ask you, when you say you're long energy, are you long the commodities? Or are you long the refineries and like, like MPC and like Exxon Mobil and stuff like that? Um, I have, so I have about, I have a 10% position and I have a 2% position in an Occidental, Exxon, Halliburton, XLE and mm -hmm. OIH. So I don't, yeah, that's it. And so mm -hmm. those are the ones I have. And I'd like to buy, I'd like to buy more if we get a pullback. Uh, again, from the whole thesis that I've discussed. And I think those are, you know, I could have bought, I, yeah. I, I should have, I actually, I did have some, but I did take some profit on a, on a few, but I'd like to have more. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Bring us the down market. We'll buy quality. That's how I do things for long term. You you yeah. focus on the great businesses that you know are going to keep growing. They're streamlining their operations. They're either vertically or horizontally integrating. They're growing. It's inelastic sectors, and you know these are things that we're going to need. You know we need we need these we need energy. You know to heat our homes and to you know power we're still going to have you know um, carbon you know ice cars you know internal combustible engines are going to be around you know california is changing things but you know we still need gas and you know i think that you know buying quality on these pullbacks or dips if we get that who knows what's in store for this year i'm thinking sideways market um but it can go anyway and let's yeah, say it goes I, down I think further. you're right I think you're right on a sideways market, and I, I've I, I've I've said that I I thought it was going to be around like thirty seven hundred to mm. forty one hundred. We're above yeah. forty one hundred right now, and so I think we're a little stretched on the upside. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow's CPI number, which mm. uh, this will probably be out uh, after, uh, it could you know send the markets up or down two percent, and um, you know it's, if I'm sh net short it probably won't feel so great but mm -hmm. uh it, it will you know we'll adjust we've got earnings coming up and that's really really important and again my mm -hmm. big thesis for that is that we're going to see a slowdown in demand mm -hmm. and Agreed. it's really hard for me to see stocks go up when demand is starting to taper and, and that's um that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at. Yeah. Right well, now. you've been using the word recession a few times. So uh -huh. I was going to ask you, what are your thoughts on a recession this year? Do you think that it's something that's going to come or are you in a stagflation camp? Do you think that's a possibility? Well, both. Yeah, I think, mm. I, I think, uh -huh. I think um, inflation will, will, the core and core inflation is going to remain elevated. Exactly. I was just going to say that core core inflation month over month is still it, it, rising. It'll, it'll moderate a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's the sticky stuff. You know, the, the transitory stuff is starting to come down. Mm -hmm. uh, it has come down um, and that's great. Um, and I think 
everybody expected that, but there's the core stuff that um, food and energy costs. And I, I just don't see that. I mean, and again, if energy starts to go up again, I think that's going to be a, a oh. problem um, for we see a CPI. Reset. Yeah, we could see a reacceleration there. Um, yeah, I mean, if we see a reacceleration, that's going to send all the people that hope the Fed will cut and pivot. And <laughs> that, that's that's not happening uh, no. this year. And, and as far as recession, you know, there's the soft, you know, the soft landing, hard landing. Um, it, it, I, I have shown this on before a friend of mine sent me that all these clippings from the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s of soft landing uh, right before it was a hard landing. And it, it's it's the hopeful thinking that it's a hard, it's a soft landing. And Hey, maybe maybe this will maybe it'll be true. My base case is that we will go in a recession probably mm -hmm. um, towards the later part of the year. And then again, yes. you know what? It might be a 2024 situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not, you know, it's not a soft landing if you lost your job mm -hmm. uh, for anybody. And I, I've lost my job. I've I've been there where it's it's pretty scary, and I've I've watched industries change to where there's mass layoffs on wall street and nobody can get a job and people have to sell houses and cars and get rid of stuff and it's it's it's, it's tough yeah, it's tough it's on tough. families i think if anything right now i think it's the time that people should start thinking okay i'm going to limit my spending i'm going to mm -hmm. be pulling in some of the excess that i could spend and and put it towards towards savings and being uh, better with their their savings and um, savings rates are starting to come down overall and that's going to be tough you want to make sure you're not levered or have too much debt credit card debt is kind of the silliest thing you can do um, so i think that that's that's my my thought i'm recession is in my base case um it, if we get into a recession, it it just may take longer to get out of the recession. And that's something a lot of people don't understand, especially coming out of a recession that was induced by high inflation and the Fed tightening. That's just something that people in their careers have not been through. And, and we've been through pullbacks in the economy. And generally it's from an event or something. And uh, um, the Fed has come in and saved the day. But, you know, if the Fed comes in and saves the day again, they're just going to, you know, mm -hmm. perpetuate I, the problem. I'm not like a Fed. I'm not like a Fed hater, mm -hmm. but they have this terrific track record of fixing problems that become problems that then they have to fix. And it's a cycle that they just keep doing. Mm -hmm. And by, I mean, they, they overdid it for COVID with the response. And I know Jay Powell and all the others are, are like, why did we do so much? They didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know we we're all locked up in our houses on Zoom with masks. I mean, it was like <laughs> yeah. a different world. Totally um, different. But they overdid it. And the Fed balance sheet is, is too high. And there's going to come a point, I don't know when, that uh, that's going to become an issue. And there's going to be probably other central banks around the world that are going to have that problem before the U S and it could be China. I mean, not China, well, maybe China, but Japan comes mm -hmm. to mind. Uh, the ECB is always kind of out there as far as stretched and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I think it's just, it, it's the Fed makes it up as they go. And sometimes we have to do the same. Exactly. I agree completely with you. Uh, I think it's important to remain liquid during this time. And I always talk about having cash, um, you know, remaining liquid to seize opportunities. I do think it, opportunities are incoming. Um, there will be probably more difficulties upcoming. And for me, in my opinion, I could, you know, I'm already planning in my mind that recovery may be 2025. I mean, it may be a ways away. 
Um, there could be more difficulties. However, you know, there's that expression that says, prepare for the worst, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. So, you know, it doesn't hurt to hold on a little more cash, like we said earlier. So what? So I miss a little bit of a run. You know, there'll be always be opportunities again. Um, better to be safe than sorry. So, you know, remaining liquid, you know, banks are tightening their lending standards. I mean, they're trying to reduce risk. You know, we have all those issues going on. They're higher rates. Um, so it means higher cost of debt and capital. And like you said, credit card debt, I mean, that rate is like crazy right now. I mean, it's only going to get, you know, it's high. And so, you know, it's it's best to pay down those debts. And I always say that unless you're secured at a very low rate, you know, you get these mortgages at like two something percent, you know, um, besides that, you know, short term debt, you know, it's at a higher rate. So it's best to pay those off. And that's a better return. It's, it's a guaranteed return. You pay down like, you know, an eight, 10 percent, you know, interest rate that you have. I mean, you know, hey, you know, why pay that? Keep the cash for safety. Um, and, you know, we don't know what's in store. And, you know, I love that you mentioned blackjack. It's funny you play blackjack. My dad was a blackjack player um, for fun, you know, and everything. But I just recently watched this documentary on I don't know if it's on Amazon. You should see it. It's really cool. It's about card counting. And it goes through this right. guy who is a professional blackjack card counter. He doesn't do anything illegal, but he just, he counts cards. So all the casinos have banned it. They know who he is and they don't want him there because he actually beats the system. It's called like something blackjack club. It's like, a, it's an advantage. Oh yeah. It's the advantage players club. Have you heard of that? I haven't seen that, but I, I've read a lot of you know stories and about, and I know people that that do count cards. Um, it's the, the the casinos make it a little harder by you know creating larger decks. Um, yeah, and they and they spot the counters uh, pretty quickly. Um, so the, yeah, there's um, there's a lot of that, but uh, it the, the casinos generally find ways to catch those 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 players um so that's you know there's always a people are always trying to find an edge in some sort of yeah trading or blackjack or roulette. they always try to find that edge <laughs> yeah but, well yeah. that's you know that's the point you know you 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 want to find something that it's a process it works and um it, you know one thing that you know like i i was talking to a fund manager the other day and he's moving to a new fund and we just kept saying, you know, I'm trying to coach him a little bit. I said, you know, your, your process has to be understandable and repeatable. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So when you're talking to this new fund, you have to explain to them how your process works, make it very simple. And then you have to repeat that process over and over and demonstrate that. That's essentially what a fund manager how how do you get a job at a hedge fund or a mutual fund? I have a process. It works, and it's repeatable. Simple, exactly. easy to understand. That's Buy low, need. sell high. That's it. That's you know. It's just... <laughs> Be consistent and have a simple process, and just keep repeating it. And if it works, keep doing it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I want to know your thoughts on currency. You talked about the dollar recently and Bitcoin. And I've been seeing you tweet about that. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on Bitcoin? Is it has it you know proven to you now that it could be an alternative currency and a store of value as it's holding like about thirty thousand now? I'll talk. I'll talk about the dollar first. Okay. Uh, first of all, I think the dollar. Um, I, I, um, we caught the top in the dollar pretty well. We had Demar indicator you know sell signals in the dollar uh we recently had some buy buy signals on the daily time frame and and it bounced a bit uh but it's it's drifting lower and i think that's part of the overall risk sentiment uh with the lower dollar um has been, been it, and that, that actually might be a head or tailwind for some mm -hmm. companies reporting um because of the lower dollar they complain about the dollar uh, with it down this quarter, I'm going to scream. I'm just going to say, well, you were complaining on the way up. Now you're complaining on the way down. <laughs> but the the point is that uh, I think that the dollar has risk to go lower. Mm -hmm. And maybe the central banks, they all talk and they are thinking, well, maybe it's time for the dollar to cool off a bit and 
So some of the emerging market debt will stabilize a bit. And they, they sort of go through these cycles of, of, of that. So I think the dollar is a little bit at risk to go lower. If we start to get a risk off, um, we see risk off mentality and we start to see inflation mm -hmm. data increasing, then the dollar is going up again mm -hmm. um, easily. Uh, as far as Bitcoin and, and well, so the DeMarc indicators are really pretty good at spotting tops and bottoms. Uh, I, I've i never traded Bitcoin. I tend to, I have to find a, a reason if I'm buying anything of what it is and how I can value it. And I just haven't been able to, in my own mind and other people have their, you know, they, they have their ways of looking at it and that's fine. Uh, and I hope everybody makes, you know, I hope it goes to a million, you know, if you're, mm -hmm. you're long, it's great. But I just haven't been able to get behind it because I just don't understand the intrinsic value of it. And I know that there will, there's this X amount of Bitcoins that are going to be able to be produced. And this one just may go without me. And I'm okay with that. But the DeMarc indicators have been really pretty good as far as spotting tops and bottoms over the years. And I currently think it could go, it's a 30,000, 30,000, 249 right now. That's price. Wow. Come to me for your quotes. Yeah, you um, have them right there. So wow. I, I, got, I got screens all over. Um, <laughs> so I, I think it could go a little higher. And I, I just think that uh, that's an, that's another one that uh, I just don't I just don't understand. And it seems to me like everybody's sort of, oh, we, we got to pump it to get someone new or a country to buy it or Elon Musk to buy it. And that gives it authenticity. You know, that it's 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 good then. And you want to buy it. I just am worried that there's a lot of bad actors that have bought crypto and we read some stuff about Binance recently uh, that was not very favorable as far as some of the clients of theirs, um, Middle Eastern terrorists and such that were, were trading around on, on their platform and Bitcoin and there's money laundering. And, and if there's money to be made and money's being made, there's one thing that will happen and the government's going to get involved because mm -hmm. they want that money. And that's been always, it'd be my luck that I would buy it. And then the next day, Gary Gensler comes out and bans it or something. <laughs> happens. And as much as that sounds insane that it, it oh, that can't happen. It can, they can do whatever they want. The SEC can ban Bitcoin trading in the US. Uh, another country can, and other countries have. Um, they could, you know, damage a, uh, I mean, they're, they could go after Coinbase. Base, uh, which I'm short. Mm. It's been a little bit suspect in the last two days, mm -hmm. but that um, they could go after them and stop them and prevent them from making money, which they don't make money, which is weird. Uh, but I, I, there's just it just doesn't work out. And and you know what? I'm pretty good at doing other stuff. Exactly. So I really don't need it. You know, that's what I was going like, to say. Yeah. I, I I don't need I don't need to learn about this and there's other people that are a lot smarter about it and more focused on it and it trades 24 hours a day seven days a week and i kind of like the markets closed on the weekend so i'm not like looking at my stupid phone and going oh my god it's down eight yeah. percent on saturday morning when i'm waking yeah. up trying to like have coffee and relax no yeah. it's gonna stress me out I, I, so it can go without me but i i do analyze it i do put it on yeah. my notes every day of what I think the price is going to do, but I, I have no, that. no stake in the game. I've never bought it or shorted it. And uh, I probably should have, but uh, well, I have, again, it would be my, that my day <laughs> that it, oof, it's banned. Yeah. And then uh, right after you buy it, I have to so, say, I, I so respect you and I admire your everything, your whole thesis with investing and trading and, you know, your research it's, um, Everything you say is all like it, you painted a whole picture and it's exactly what you said earlier. And, you know, do what works for you and your personality. Trading is about you. It's a personal experience. 
And, you know, some people may like to trade 24 hours a day. There's some people who like to trade at night in bed. I also am not one to, to do that. Okay. I've done that though. I've traded <laughs> in the middle of the night in foreign countries way back when. And it, it it's not settling. It's no. No. Not, not, it's I just, keep getting a call yeah. from India in the middle of the night. And, <laughs> oh, sorry, your infosis has gone down. I'm like, Oh, I remember that one. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, you know, it's like Buffett said, know what you own, invest. You have plenty of opportunities in this market. And so why go and venture off to something that you may not know as well and may not fit your style? Um, and I, you know, I also love, I wanted to mention the embracing the losses. I love that. Like, that's something that I would put as a plaque over my desk. I mean, that's how um, just profound that statement is. Because it's so important to embrace losses in trading and in life because they happen. And those challenges, you know, have to, they, they occur and they're part of life. And if you don't take a risk, you know, you really didn't try hard enough because risk taking risks and having mistakes and losses are part of the process. So embrace them and release them yeah. and move on yeah, I, don't, I don't think i don't think i want you to get a plaque over your desk <laughs> um that's just bad karma you know okay <laughs> just 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 sell them and you know just cut them go get a glass of wine and relax for the night and don't don't think about it mm -hmm. it's okay it's okay it's, it's I just love that. money you know it's, it's just money i love it. you're so calming with that you know <laughs> with that i'd love to ask you what your favorite cars are let's talk oh, about okay. cars when did this passion begin? Were you always a car person? I I always have been a car person. Um, I grew up in California in Los Angeles. And I grew up in a neighborhood that had celebrities and people that had cool cars. And so I'd always sort of hang out with them. And I, I, I my father took me to, you know, I, I, like early on, like Formula One races and Mm -hmm. Long Beach and so I was really young going to all these things but I love cars and I love um there were there were a couple of Ferraris in the neighborhood that uh, I would just you know go over and my friend's dad would drive a 250 Lusso and mm -hmm. you know it's like that's pretty freaking cool mm -hmm. and this, it sounded cool and there's like a visceral thing to a car that I really really enjoy so i i i currently drive a um bmw m2 mm. uh it's, it's it's nothing you know it's it's fun and it's fast and i added a little extra horsepower and stuff it's loud my wife hates it. <laughs> what, it, what color so is loud. it but i've had porsches and other fun cars and uh it's it's gray it's very basic it's not mm -hmm. i don't i can't stand Classy. out i'm in greenwich connecticut i can't you know it's loud enough in greenwich <laughs> but there's there's a lot of very cool cars here but i love classic cars i love old ferraris and old porsches and and i i, I actually really like rolls royces a lot i can never get a rolls royce because it's just so ostentatious but they're so finely beautifully engineered and mm -hmm. they're luxurious and i, I love them I've owned 30 Range Rovers mm. uh, between my wife and I, um, old ones, which is, it's, I, people are like rolling their eyes. Yeah, they're money pit at times, uh, but they're just cool. I like and, the old ones um, too. I don't own a new one. I have a, so I, my winter car is a 2011 Range Rover. Mm. It's just, it's nice. It's a V8. It's good motor. Nothing, it doesn't break that often. Um I think I want to get a Porsche. I'm 58. I'm going to get a Porsche when I'm 60, a new Porsche. Uh, that's my goal when I turn 60. Hmm, I'll uh, join I've you had with several that. Porsches, like 911s. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's, uh, and, you know, so like, I, I like, you know, and I'm, I'm a pretty unassuming person. I, I don't live like extravagant, you know, uh -huh. in any form, but cars for me are really important. And uh, I, I actually, and I have a grandson who's three. And oh. I have three daughters, and this is my oldest daughter's um, first baby, and he's totally into cars, like 
Obsessed. Oh, your grandson? Oh, nice. Your he, first grandson. He walks around the house with holding two cars, like monster trucks. Ooh. Loves this blaze, the monster truck guy. So like, wait, hold on. And then my right here. How cute. You got the so gift that you, you ever- can't see this. But this is Charlie. Oh, you guys and are we cute. And we were at the Greenwich Concours and I took him there a year ago. And I'm like, this is the car from the movie Cars. And he didn't know what the movie Cars was mm -hmm. at that time. But I'm like, we just have to take a picture of this, Charlie, with you next to the car. So I, I got him that picture framed in his Aww. house. And now he's obsessed with it. He's like, I can't believe I met Lightning McQueen. You know, like, yeah, Lightning McQueen. Because <laughs> of me. But he's obsessed with it. So like, That's I, cute. I, and I love going to uh, Formula One races. I've taken my daughters to races. My wife and I are going to go to the Las Vegas Grand Prix. She's never been to a race. Ooh. She's an interior designer. Um, and not necessarily a Formula One fan, mm -hmm. but she will be after this race. Yes. She'll have a good time. So I so I cool. love cars. I love being able to integrate hedge fund telemetry, the name and the, the whole process of what it. I do um, with that. I love engineering. I fix cars. I do stuff like that all the time. And um, I love yeah, that. Really, I read that really on your... I read that on your website, how you get in early, you collect and analyze the data, you relay that information to the team to properly balance the firm's portfolio. And it's like, that's like what you do in the racing and how I love how that you made that analogy. Um, Cause it's like getting that information. It, it, that's so cool. I just, I love that. You, you want to have an optimal setup. Yes. And your portfolio uh, that that works for you, that's going to work for the market and the conditions, just like a car, you, you, you want to make sure you have the right tires and the right settings and where it's not blowing up and it's it's going to... Yeah, we don't want know. it to blow up. No, that's no. something we don't want. <laughs> no, no. We don't, I, I once had a car blow up, but uh, oh. that, was, that was that was another BMW, a BMW M3. Oh, the M3, yes. Oh, yeah. gosh. That... That one got away. I always get, I, okay, truth, truth story. Um, I regret, I never regret buying or selling any stocks and saying, oh, I wish I still mm -hmm. had that. I do wish, you know, I wish I still owned Apple from 1988. But, of course. Um, yeah, that would have been great. Mm -hmm. But I do look back on a lot of the cars that I've sold and say, never should have sold that one. I, uh, it was a dumb move. And now I see them, they're going for like, God, the money and that's it because they're unique they're like unique cars so when you sell it it's not you can't necessarily buy it back like you can a stock um, yeah I, so. I think I think I'm gonna take my my m2 which is sitting out there I'm gonna hide it I'm not gonna so my wife's <laughs> not gonna know that I, I still have it <laughs> I'm gonna store it somewhere yeah and you know hopefully on a good day or something I can say oh by the way I still own that car and I won't get in not much trouble but you know mm. look it's, it's it's a marriage you know what does she drive like, what's her what's uh, her type of car she drives a range rover that's nice she's like, oh no it's yeah i mean she has good taste too well she's you know she's an interior decorator you know she has expensive taste i can't <laughs> afford her work or her you know not at all but uh you know it's like someone once said that you know if there was a fire in the house, she'd open up a, a case of Dom Perignon and put the fire out with a case <laughs> of champagne, you know? I love oh, it. yeah. But I've been married almost 30 years, so it's, uh, it's worked it out. Works. It works still, out look, great. We're still going. That's great. That's, she's going to keep you trading and being in the hedge fund business for a long time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm in my office six days a week. It's mm -hmm. Love your and passion. Her office is next door, so it's uh, it's nice. We get to see each other a lot. That's awesome. You know, Tom, this has been so wonderful. You are brilliant. You're so experienced. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us everything and your hedge oh, fund telemetry. You. What you've created is amazing. And I want you to please tell everyone about your services that you offer for all investors. And I okay. do believe there's a special code for our listeners. Okay, so I put out three notes a day, uh, one in the morning, one in the midday, and then the afternoon. There's trade ideas on there. I run a trade idea sheet, which is run as a portfolio. I put out a couple notes during the weekend about what's happening for the next week. Uh, 
it's a lot of technical stuff. It's a lot of sometimes a little humor, um, sent, you know, sentimental type stuff about life and trading. And so for anybody that is interesting, you can go to uh, hedgefundtelemetry.com. We have a special first year discount for the annual rate off the annual rate of $250 off the annual rate of $750. Using the code, it's very hard to remember this one, markets, markets. Okay, it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so put that in and we'll give you a discount. And uh, no, we're really very, very uh, pleased and uh, we also send a, send everybody a book on DeMarc indicators so they can uh, get up to speed on how they work. It took me about 20 years to figure out how they all work, um, but we'll try and get you up to speed a little faster. Awesome. Thank you so much for everything. I appreciate all of this and uh, you take care and thank you to all the listeners. Thank you for listening to The Row Show Podcast. Please visit rosannaprestia.com for more episodes. See you soon. All investment, real estate, financial, legal, and tax opinions expressed by Rosanna Prestia or on The Row Show should not be relied upon as professional advice and are intended to be used for informational purposes only.